Okay, good morning class. Good morning. So at this point we're looking at uh, the grade 11, final examination paper 1, November 2019. At this point we have done one video already, no? Yes. Right. In preparation for our upcoming um, November exam, okay. So, we are asked to write a function in the turning point form by completing the square. So if we complete the square, so it will be f of x is equal to 3x squared plus 6x. The first thing we need to do is to take out 3 as a common factor. So it's x squared plus 2x. Okay. Now to complete the square with, I must add a number and I must subtract the same number. Not so. In this case, it's going to be b times a half, which is 2 times a half, which is 1, and 1 squared is 1. So here is our perfect square trinomial, which is 3 into x plus 1 squared minus 1. And we multiply the 3 in, it's going to be 3 into x plus 1, all squared minus 3. Okay? So that is for 4 marks in. Then it says, Question says, find the minimum value of f and the corresponding x value at which the minimum value occurs. So, in 4.1.2, this graph is a smiling graph. It has a minimum value at negative 1 and negative 3. Can you see that? So, what is the minimum value? And therefore, f of x has a minimum value of minus 3 and occurs at x is equal to negative 1. That's for 2 marks. Okay? Is that correct? Does it even know when I gave it wrong, no? So I gave you the memo or easy to the paper. Alright, let's carry on with our lives. 4.2 we are told for 6 marks. Solve the equation simultaneously. Okay? So, as you can see here, we are in here. Why is the subject of the formula? Let's call this equation 1. And equation 2. So, we're going to substitute equation 1 into equation 2. Okay? So, we have 2x. Wherever we see a y, we put the x squared minus 4. So, 2x is equal to x squared minus 4 plus 4. That then gives you 0. So, 0 equals x squared minus 2x. As I put that over the equal sign x of course is a common factor so therefore x is equal to 0 or x is equal to well what do I do with that? I sub it back into any of the two I'm going to go with equation 1 so y is equal to 0 squared minus 4 which is negative 4 on the other hand we've got y is equal to 2 squared minus 4 which is 0 Then in 4.2.2, the question says, sketch the two equations of the Cartesian plane clearly showing all the intercepts with the axis, turning point and points of intersection. So here we got the equation of a parabola. Y is equal to x squared minus 4. So the one is y is equal to x squared minus 4. And the other equation was... Um, We've got 2x is equal to y plus 4. 2x is equal to y plus 4, which can be written as y is equal to 2x minus 4. So when you go with the parabola, the x-intercept is y equal to 0. So 0 is equal to x squared minus 4. Difference of two squares. So you get minus 2 and 2. Not so. Whilst you have a y-intercept at negative 4. Okay? So that is... The equation of y is equal to x squared minus 4. That's your parabola. The straight line is going through a y value of minus 4 and an x value, so your y value is minus 4, and x value let y equal to 0 of 2. So that is the other equation. The here is y is, uh, you got the y plus 4 is equal to 2x. Or y is equal to 2x minus 4. Okay. And uh, from the graph as well, you can see that the point of intersection is 0 and minus 4. 
and 2 and 0, which confirms this information, 0 and minus 4, and 2 and 0. Can you see that? Confirms that calculation. Then in 4.3, it says write down the equation of the new graph in the form of y is equal to h squared plus bx plus c, which is the quadratic form, the, form, um, the standard form for the quadratic equation. If the parabola moves, if the parabola is moved to have x is equal to 3 as the axis of symmetry. So which means to say, what's happening here is the axis of symmetry is now there at x equal to 3. So if we take this graph into account, and we move that graph in that direction. So that's what the graph is going to look like, not so. And that is going to now be your point of a turning point if needed. But the question is, write the equation of the new graph in that form. So if you shift the graph, so the graph is actually shifting three units to the right. So what do we do on the x? Subtract the three. If it moves to the right, you subtract. If it moves to the left, you add. So in other words, the solution for 4.2.3, if that is your equation, y is equal to um, x squared minus 4, then it's going to be y is equal, y is equal to, it's moving 3 uh, units to the, to the right, so it's x minus 3 squared minus 4. So from here, it's a matter of simplifying. So it's x squared minus 6, x plus 9 minus 4. Then I'm going to give you, uh, x squared minus 6x six, six plus and uh, this is the equation of okay, let's just equation in before y is equal to x squared plus bx plus c. Does it make sense people? Okay. Is it good? Yes. Right. So that basically brings us to the end of uh, question four. Let's go to question five now. Question five this is match each of the following graphs with the correct equation. Just write down the correct number for each sketch. Okay. So what type of graph is the first one? It's an exponential function, not so. So an exponential function is either um, C, no, either E or F, as you unknown in the exponent. Okay, it's either E or F. No? However, what do you notice here? You have a Horizontal asymptote at a, y is equal to 1. So can it be if? No, because the horizontal asymptote is 0 here. So that answer, 5.1 is E. Okay. You all agree with that? Now, looking at 5.2, what type of graph is 5.2? Parabola graph, not so. So it's either A or D. Not so. But what do I have here? I have my turning point. So that's y is equal to a into uh, x plus 3 squared plus 1. You see? Could be this one. Not so. So uh, if I multiply this out, you see we don't know what a is, but in both cases a is 1. Okay, so if a is 1, then it has to be a. That, that the answers fit best. No, it's not. No. You see, I even trick myself. Okay. To think that it's so easy. So, we, in both cases, A is 1, so I assume A to be 1. Okay. So, it's going to be X minus 1 squared. Uh, one, um, X minus 3 squared plus 1. So, it's going to be X squared minus 6X plus 9 plus 1 be x squared minus 6x plus t. Which makes our answer actually t. Okay. This is actually a good one. Eh? And then um, 5.3 is a hyperbola graph. Not so. So it's either um, b or c. However, this is y is equal to minus 1 as a horizontal asymptote. Which one? Which both equations as. Not so. Then, this, this line here, which is y is equal to, um, k, in, k in both cases is 1, as you can see. Then, eh? 1 over x minus 3 uh, minus 1. That's your equation of this graph. However, 
we look at this one here, there's a positive here. So that's not the case. However, that is swapped around. So let's swap around and see what happens. A negative comes up. And then negative they put on top. So it's actually um, B. 5.3 B is that answer. Good question. You don't just any mini minimo. It's you first think about it before you make your selection. Okay. Question six. In question six, we are told that the graphs of f of x equals. Let's make this a bit smaller. Question six, we are told that the graphs of f of x equal to a into x minus b squared plus q, and g of x is equal to a over x minus b plus q. Okay, have been sketched in the diagram below. So what do you notice about, without reading anything further than this, what do you notice about this, these um, equations? It's in standard form, yes, what else do you notice? Don't you notice that in equation of f of x and g of x, you got the same variables, which is q, a and x, can you see that? Which means to say if that is the case, then the a in f of x is the same as the a in g of x. The q in a, uh, uh, f of x is the same as the q in g of x, and likewise the p in f of x is the same as the p in g of x. It's deliberately um, uh, um, given those values there. Okay. The thing here. Okay, so determine the values of A, B, and Q. So as we can see here, the turning point on your uh, on F is 2 and, one, 2 and 1, not so. So your F of X equation now is F of X equal to A into X minus 2 plus 1. So your P value is 2 and your Q value is 1 in both cases. Okay, and work with the parameter first. Then, I need one point that's lying on this graph. Do I have such a point? Yes. So at this point, I'm going to substitute A, which is 3 and 3, into f of x. It will give us 3 is equal to A into 3 minus 2 squared plus 1. So that gives us 2. So your A is 2. So f of x is equal to 2 into x minus 2 squared plus 1. Okay? Which means to say the equation of this is going to be 2 over x minus p plus, plus 1. Okay? It's going to be a over x minus 2 plus 1. So, of course, there'll be a 2. Yeah? That is over x. Okay. If you had gone with our popular and worked out with G of X, you would have gotten the same ones. Okay. So let's carry on with our lives. In 6.1.2, which is 6.1.2, there's basically nothing under there. Question 6.1.2, we are told, write down the equation of the asymptotes of g of x. So what's the equation of the asymptotes of g of x? Um, x is equal to 2, and y is equal to 1. Can you guys see here, that's your one asymptote, and there's your other asymptote of g of x. Can you all see that, people? Okay. So, uh, 6.1.2, so x is equal to 2, um, and y is equal to 1. In 6.1.3, it says, write down the equation of the axis of symmetry of g 
in the form y is for mx plus c, for which m is greater than 0. What does m greater than 0 mean? It means to say m has to be positive. So it's going to be in the form of y is equal to 1x plus c. Do you all agree with that? Y is equal to? 1x plus c. Okay. If it said m is less than 0, then y is equal to minus x plus c. Do you all agree with that? So the one is going through like that, and the other one is going through. Those are the two axles of symmetry. The one they're looking at particularly is this one here. Okay? So in order to calculate C, I must work, I must substitute the, the point where the two asymptotes meet. Not so. So we're going to substitute uh, T, which is 2 and 1. So the uh, Y is 1, so 1 is equal to 1 times 2 plus C. So C works out to be minus 1. So Y is equal to X minus 1. Okay? Y is equal to X minus 1. Alright, let's look at the next question. We can the domain and range question now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this information off here. Okay. So in 6.1.4 it says state the range of f of x. People, what is range? All possible? Y values. Does this parabola exist at negative to infinity? No. Where does parabola start existing at? One onwards. Not so. So 6.1.4. What's my, my answer to that? Y must be greater or equal to? No. Did you see that? 6.1.5. Determine the y-intercept of f of x. How do you calculate the y-intercept? That is going to be this point. Y intercept, we let x equal to 0. So you say f of 0 equals 2 times 0 minus 2 squared plus 1. Okay, so that's going to give you 4, 8, 9. So the y intercept of uh, f is 9. Y is equal to 9. If they asked you for the coordinates, then I would have said 0 and 9. Okay, but since the coordinates wasn't asked, you won't be uh, penalized if you put just 9 there. Okay. However, if the question explicitly says coordinates, please don't forget to write the coordinate form. Okay, and this is the last question pertaining 6.1. It says, in 6.1.6, uh, it says determine the value of x for which g of x, 6.1.6, where g of x, minus f of x is greater than n or equal to 0. So in other words, if they get over the equal sign in the read, where g of x is greater than or equal to f of x. Not so? So, in other words, where the g of x graph is on top of the f of x or equal to the f of x graph. So if you look, we always read inequalities and things like that, domain range from left to right. Likewise, in this case, we're also reading from left to right. Okay. So what we do is we say, okay, is looking from, from this side here, no? Is your pretty eyebrows, eyelashes, from on top, looking from on top here, all the way down. Let's see. Is G on top here or is F on top? Which graph is on top? F of X, not so. As you can see here, F is on top here. But that's not what I'm looking for, not so. However, however, what, what is G? G is the hyperbola. No? So yeah, the G is still at the bottom, not so. Still not what I'm looking for. No, we need to have the G on top. G has to be greater than. Okay, and here we see that G is on top, from there till there, that's it. 
And the other side of A, if it's again on top of G. Can you see that? If it's on top of G. If it's greater than G. So in other words, is that a continuous solution or a bracket solution from 2 to 3? Continuous. So you must be able to put together. So you've got X, the smaller one who is on the left and the big one on the right. So X has to be greater than 2, but less than 3. But coming back to the sum, the sum has equal as well. Okay. Are the graphs equal at 2? No, there's an asymptote. So do I put the equal sign here? No. Are they equal at 3? Yes. And that's where that equal sign comes in. Okay. Very important, very useful to know how to write inequalities. Okay. Let's look at 6.2. 6.2, we are told that sketch below is the graph of y equals f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Okay, and g of x equals 2x plus c. Again, what do you notice? There's two c's, which you need to say those values are the same. Okay, the variable values are the same. And yes, it definitely makes a sense. Why? Because we have a common y and this Okay? The graphs intersect at the y-intercept and at the point negative 2 and negative 1, which is also the turning point of it. Okay. Go to the question. The question says, determine the value of A. This is 6 point. Determine the value of A. So, of course, A belongs to the diagram, not so. <coughs> A belongs to the, the diagram. Uh, A belongs to, sorry, to the equation of the parabola, not so. But we know the turning point, so what we're going to do is, if we put this in f of x form, f of x is equal to A into x minus p squared plus q. So that would simply be A into x minus minus 2, which is plus 2. Uh, minus 1. So that is f of x. Now, in order to calculate my a value, I need a point that's lying on that graph, which I don't have at this point. Not so. However, we can calculate the y intercept. Not so. What do I need in order to calculate my y intercept? I need to know the full equation of g of x. That's, that's your c value. Not so. So, in pursuit of calculating C, I need a point that's lying on G of X to calculate C. Do I have such a point? Yes. So what you're going to do is you're going to substitute a T, which is negative 2 and negative 1, into G of X. Remembering that's an X and a Y. So negative 1 is equal to 2 times negative 2 plus C. So C is 3. So that's your Y intercept. Not so. So, the coordinate of the y intercept is 0 and 3. Now what we do is we substitute a 0 and 3 into f of x. Okay? That's an x and a y. That's a y. So 3 is equal to 8 times 3. No. 8 times. What's your x value? 0 plus 2 squared minus 1. They get over becomes 4. So uh, 2 squared is 4, is equal to 4, so A is equal to 4. And there we go. For 5 marks, your A value is. Okay. Now we are on question 7. In question 7, we are told that a computer server valued at 24,000 Rand depreciates at 18% per annum on the reducing balance method. Determine the value of the server after 3 years. So there's two types of depreciation. Is the depreciation on diminishing balance or reducing balance method? Which is the formula we're going to use. Which is A is equal to P into 1 minus I time uh, to the exponent N. And depreciation on state line basis. Which is A is equal to P into 1 minus I times N. Okay. So your P value of course is going to be 24,000 N. 1 minus your interest rate is 0, 0,18 to the exponent, 3 years. So that gives you, whoops, 
that gives you 24,000 N into 1 minus 0 0.18 uh, to the exponent. So we get 13,232 N and 83 cents. Okay. You guys understand? Right, next question. We are asked to determine the annual effective interest rate of 14% interest compounded monthly. Now, this formula is not given in your exam. Okay, you need to memorize it. Well, in this, you're, you're not getting no formulas at all, actually. Okay, so not only this, but um, no formulas given. So the, um, memorize the formulas that we need. So 1 plus i effective is equal to 1 plus i to the m over m to the m. Okay? So determine the annual effective interest rate of 40 per compound monthly. So you've got 1 plus, well, so you look at 1 form, compounded monthly to the exponent 12, 1 plus i. So your rate is going to be, you're going to say, um, open brackets, 1 plus 0, 1, 4 over 12. What does that mean? 1 plus. The exponent 12 minus 1 times 100. As the one, the rate, as we know, the effective interest rate is just a, a bit more than the than the, um, the nominal interest rate. So that's going to be 14, 93%. Okay. Normally we work with two decimal places, unless otherwise stated. The next question in 7.3. In 7.3, we are told that Dan invests money at an interest rate of 8.5% per annum, simple interest. How many years would it take his money to double? So, how much was invested? No, no amount is given. So, if he had invested 100 rand, then his return will be 1. If he invested 1,000 rand, his return will be 2,000. If his investment is X, his return will be 2X. So it's simple interest, simple interest formula, A is equal to P into 1 plus I times E. So your A value is 2X, while your P value is X into 1 plus I, which is 0, 0,085 times N. And N is what you want to calculate. Remember, you can use any values for P. Eh? If you use 1, it's going to be 2, and so on and so on. I just use x and 2. So I divide by both sides by x. I then have 2 is equal to 1 plus 0, 0,085 n. So I get 1 over, it's going to be 1 is equal to that. I then divide that 1 by 0, 0,085. Okay, so it's 1 over 0, 0,085, which gives you 11,76 years. Is that correct? Yes. Huh? Yes. Okay. If you want, you can then say it takes approximately 12 years. Okay, because I, um, your investment is normally year by year. Okay, but they didn't say to the year this year, at least, or whatever. So, they also didn't say after um, how many old years will it take. Okay? If it was old years, then you should have answered to 12. Uh, in 7.4, in 7.4 we are told that beginners <coughs> win. In 7.4, rand is invested at 8% per annum, compounded quarterly. So that's over 4, no? After 9 years the interest rate changed, compounded monthly. How much is invested after 15 years? So this is a basic timeline question. A very simple timeline question. Mind you, so it's 2854. 8% compound quarterly. 
say for the first nine years, he's going to be 0.08% um, compounded quarterly, then changes to 10.5% um, per annum compounded monthly. How much will he have at the end of 15 years? So that will be 10 So what we do is we basically take an amount, the interest rate changes there, and at the end again. So your A total is going to be P into 1 plus I to the exponent N, which is 2850 into 1 plus 0, 0.08 over 4 to the exponent 4 times. And how many years is this first uh, leg for? 9 years. That gives you a principle at this point, not so. Then he's going to draw an interest for another 6 years. So that principle times 1 plus 0, comma, uh, 105 over 12 to the exponent 12 times. That is um, 6 years. Okay. So it's going to be 2850, open brackets, 1 plus 0, 0 0.08 over 4 to the exponent 4 times 9. Um, open brackets, 1 plus 0, 105 over 12 to the exponent 12 times 6. We give you 10,000, is that correct? Ten thousand eight hundred eighty-five and ninety-five cents. Okay, broken up in, in, into parts, no problem. You should get the same solution. Okay. And we are number eight. Do you have to do number eight? No. Huh? No. Okay. So your homework is number eight. Which is your probability? Okay, I'm going to do it one time. Okay, so we have time. And there's not much left in this, um, in this paper, okay? So we are told that the study was conducted at two airports in order to determine whether or not planes are departing late. <coughs> the table below shows the data connected. Okay. So they're interested in uh, with regards to the um, departure of planes. So airport A and airport B, number of planes departed late is 450 at airport A, and airport B is 100, in total it's 550. Number of planes departed on time is 150, and B is uh, 300, and combined makes 450. The total number of planes is 600 at airport A, and 400 at airport uh, B. Actually, suppose there have been total number of planes departed. There's sometimes the same plane is counted in it. Okay. Determine the probability of the plane departing late. Okay, so you're not talking about airport A or airport B. So it's just late. So late comes in at 550. So the probability is going to be 550 over 1000. 550 over 1000 is 11 over 20. Okay, all agree with that? Okay, let's look at 8.2. In 8.2 we are asked to determine the probability Okay, let's just leave it out here. Let's just put it lower. We probably would need that calculation. It says, determine the probability of the plane departing from airport A and being late. So it's Departing from airport A and being late. So it's going to be 450. So you all with me then? So it's going to be the probability for um, airport A and late. It's going to be um, 450 divided by 1000. 450 divided by 1000 gives us 9 over 20. Okay. Sorry? Determine the probability of a plane departing <coughs> from input A big lane. Oh yes, you're absolutely correct. It's from airport A. It's not in total. My mistake, sorry about that. So it's 
so the probability will be 450s over 600. So they're only taking input A into account. Okay. What did I write in the memo? This. Okay. So it's 3 over 4. I'm thinking of the, the independent question now. Is that okay? Shouldn't be thinking like it. Okay, then the question says, does the data show that, here's the question I was thinking about, does the data show that of the two airports are independent of reporting on time? They want to know if they are independent. So for independent events, the probability of A intersection B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. If this is the case, then they are independent. Okay? So the one, if, uh, the one event is not dependent on the outcome of the other. So I'll take this off. Okay, let's put this here. So that, that is what I'm trying to prove for independent events. With this proof. Okay? For not independent. Or dependent events. So what I do is I take that and that into account. Okay? Now, if So we're going to look at the probability, in this case, of input A intersection late. Now, if one of the, the products are independent, then all is independent. If one is dependent, then all is dependent. The whole uh, data set is dependent on each other. Not so. So I could have gone with that, or I could have gone with that being the intersection, whatever. Okay. So the, um, the probability of airport A and being late is going to be 450 over 1,000. We work this out, no? Yes. No. Yes, what was this? Okay, 450 over 1,000 is going to be 920. Okay, so that's the intersection. That is that. Okay, so that's the intersection of airport A and being late. So now we're looking at the probability of airport A times the probability of being late. So that is going to be the end here, which is 550 over 1000 multiplied by 600 over 1000. So let's see what we're getting there. We come now to your question. Uh, what's her name? Not Zoe. What's your name? Yeah. Evan. So, are the probabilities the same? No. So that is not equal to the probability of A times the probability of being late. Since that is the case, therefore, events are not independent. Or we can say that the events are dependent. Okay. What do you want to say? Uh, um, I don't know why you use one case is that. Sorry? You, you, you listen, if I had gone with airport B and being late, then it's going to be 100 over 1,000 which is 1 over 10 and then this is going to be 550 over 1000 times 400 over 1000 okay and you will see it's not the same so it's independent so you could have used anything you could have used if I had gone with 150 can I say 150 over 1000 must be equal to 450 over 1000 times 600 over 1000 understand or if you wanted to use 300 over 1,000, then you must use um, 450 over 1,000 times 400 over 1,000. So you can use any of the, the intersections. Okay. And this shows this one in this case. Which one did I do in the memo? Uh, <coughs> same one. Same one. Okay. You will always see me use the first one. But like I said, if, it's, if one way is independent, any intersection will be independent. 
We have a question 9. In question 9 we are told that 160 trade 11s, yeah, we've got 160. We're going to move this over now. So somebody's going to read for us the questions. So 160 grade elements is asked if they take biology, accounting, or science. The Venn diagram alongside shows the results. How many people take all three subjects? Okay, how many people take all three subjects? 14, so that is no problem. Yeah, this is 14. And this is how many people take at least one of the three subjects. How many people take at least one of the three subjects? So, is one of two things I must do. At least one. I need to solve for x. Not so? But as I said, I'm going to take this over here. So we said how many learners take at least one of these subjects? So that is 9.2, no? Is that correct? Yes? Okay, if it says at least one of the subjects, then there's that, that, this, that. So the, yes, you are absolutely correct. So the only one that is not accounted for is that 24. Okay? Does it line the board quickly? Okay, yes, it's, a, it's absolutely correct in saying that it's simply going to be 24 minus the total number, not so? So, the number would be 160 minus 24, which is? 136. 136. Okay. What is 9.3's question? How many takes? Science. Science. So it's going to be that, 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 and that, not so? Okay, so uh, the number that takes sides is 14 plus 28 plus 22 plus 16, which is? Sorry? 18. 18. Okay, now 9.4. Biology and accounting. Biology and accounting, sorry. How many marks is that? 4. Four. Okay, now we need to solve it. Not so. So what do we say? We know that. Sorry? Yes? Isn't it just takes because the 14 took the science as well and it seems Say again? Isn't it just takes because What's the question? Um calculate the probability of an elicited at random takes biology and accounting only. Biology and accounting only? Yes. Oh I I uh, thought biology and accounting. If it says only, then it's only that. Okay, so it's it's x in other words. Okay, thank you, Michael. Sorry. Okay. So it will simply be the the signs we see it adds up to eighty. Let me to align it again. For some reason or other, it's jumping around now. Okay, so it's going to be 80, which is the sides, plus 38 minus x, plus x, plus 34 minus x, plus 24, and this equals 116 total. Can you see that, people? So that cancels. So you got minus x equal to um, 116, minus 80, minus 38, Minus 34, minus 24. 38. You say 38 instead of 38. 38. Negative 16. So x is equal to? 16. So if that is 16, then this will be 34 minus 16, which is 18. Is that correct? And? 12. No. 34 minus 16? 
It's 18. So this here is 18. And 4 more so is going to be 22. Is that correct? Yes. What's the next question? Sorry? Where is that? It? So we didn't need to use it. Okay, let's carry on with our lives. 9.4. Or is that resisting? Question 10, we are told that a wire of 200 meters long is cut into two pieces. One is used to form a circle and with a radius of x meters, and the other piece is used to form a square. Show that the area of the square is. Okay. So if you've got a length of wire, 200 meters long, is cut into two pieces. One is used to form a circle, let's say this is a circle on that side, and we have a square on the other side, which means to say the lens over the side. Together, it makes up a total of 200. Not so, still 200. No? The radius of the circle is x. So the radius is x. So I need to know what is the circumference of the circle in terms of x. Not so. So? How do you calculate the circumference of a circle? It will be 2 pi r. Alright. So, we got 2 pi x. Not so. That's the circumference of a circle. Now remember, this total must come off that 200. Not so. To, work, to get the parameter of the square. So it's going to be 200 minus 2 pi x. Okay, this is the, uh, the parameter of the square. You guys understand? Right. Now, how do you calculate the parameter of a square? Four times sine. Not so. Why do, I, why, why do I need to know that? So I need to know what the length of the side is, and I can square it to get the area of the square. So the parameter of the square is going to be four times sine. So it's going to be 200 minus 2 pi x equals four times sine. So I divide by four both sides. So the length of the side is equal to 400 divided by two, by, sorry, 200 divided by four is 50 minus two divided by one is a half pi x. So this is the length of the side. Okay, so how do you calculate the area? The area of the square is side squared. So it's gonna be 50 minus a half pi x all squared. And it's now a binomial square. The 50 squared is 2,500 minus 50 times a half is 25 times 2 is 50. Pi uh, plus the last term squared, so it's going to be a quarter pi squared x squared. Okay, and that's the answer there. For five months. Okay. For six months. How many of you got that right? He wasn't from so he didn't even have a chance. And none of you worked the head. No. Okay. There's a, there's a, I just thought some of you would have, you know, dig deep into the stuff. But anyway, you win some, you lose some. Eh? Right. So at this point, I've made you a copy of. Um, the paper two's answer book, not so? Yes. Right. So, uh, as I said, tomorrow's lesson, we will do the last of the measurement, which is the revision exercise. And then, if we have about an half an hour left, I will start answering this paper. Okay, the paper two. All right. So we have not much time left, but uh, you guys can stop answering these questions, okay? I'll stop the video at this point.